Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the uh, Institute for Government. My name is Peter Riddle. I'm the director here. Um, I'm particularly delighted to welcome you um, this evening because um, to a slightly different uh, event. Um, I think when we were set up, the idea of involving the judiciary in effectiveness of government wouldn't necessarily occur to those who set the Institute up five years ago. But my view was one, we need to view government in the broader sense. And indeed, the judiciary um, is a crucial part of government. And I'm very glad to see here representatives of, of other branches of government. Um, um, we have the current um, permanent secretary at the uh, de um, Department of Justice, um, one of her predecessors, although he then traded under a totally different um, title, um, the Shadow Justice Secretary, um, um, and also um, a member of the House of Lords, plus a number of civil servants and uh, um, um, eminent people from the legal profession. So we have the full range of government here. But certainly, as I say, when we were, were set up, the idea of the judiciary being significant players was, was um, I don't think, in the minds of the founders, wrongly so in my view, because the, the judges play a crucial part um, in the formulation uh, the, and also the judgment of the development of policy. And that's been uh, increasingly clear over the last um, uh, 20, 30 years. I was particularly glad to have Lord Newberger um, um, here as the President of the Supreme Court. Uh, he has played a role at, well, actually, in, in um, both the unreformed part before you were um, asked to leave the House of Lords um, um, for your judicial appointments, but you can return in due course in, in, in a number of years' time, depending on whether, of course, it's, it, it itself has been changed and reformed, but uh, um, that is a very long-term project. Um, I'm particularly pleased to have him, not only as President of the Supreme Court, but also as someone who's been very reflective um, on these issues and indeed has, reached, has made judgments, um, um, notably when he was Master of the Rolls, um, uh, in charge of the appeal courts, which have considerable significance for the executive um, in its um, performance of its functions in various ways. So the theme is judges and policy, a delicate balance. And afterwards, um, Lord Newberger said he's happy to, to answer questions on a number of themes. And I'll um, obviously uh, explain the position there. As you see, we have a hashtag, um, 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 which is judiciary. Very imaginative on the part of my colleagues on that one. Um, um, you're very fortunate, David. One event we had, we had the tweets revolving on the screen behind, which I felt was a little disconcerting and certainly wouldn't be equal to judicial um, <laughs> dignity on this occasion. So. Welcome, Lord Newbegger. I see a, a few friendly faces. Whether they are still friendly at the end of the evening remains to be seen. Um, anyone reading Walter Badgett's classic 19th century work on the English Constitution might wonder if the judiciary had any part to play in our constitutional settlement. He has chapters to cover the sovereign, the cabinet, the legislature, the executive. He discusses the checks and balances within the system, but there's no chapter on the judiciary. Even in his discussion of the United States Constitution, he gives a simple binary picture, saying that Congress rules the law while the president rules the administration. No reference to Article 3 of the Constitution, the views of the Federalist Papers authors, or the seminal case of Marbury and Madison. Badgett's readers would come away with the view that there were only two branches of the state, although they might have some, uh, if they were careful readers, some vague notion that there was something called the judiciary, as it has a brief walk-on part in the chapter on the legislature, but only to exalt the removal of the House of Lords judicial functions into what Badgett called a conspicuous tribunal, outside of and no longer hidden beneath the robes of the legislative assembly. They may equally have discovered uh, that there was a chancery court that had something to do with patents, and that there were three common law courts which were apparently self-funding. They would also find out that there was a Lord Chancellor who had lots of jobs, including that of being our chief judge. But that would be about it. Badgett isn't the last or only word on our Constitution, although he's still well worth reading. Some things have changed since his brusque treatment of the third branch of the state, not least the fact that we now do have that conspicuous tribunal, a Supreme Court, of which more later. But fundamentally, things have not changed. In particular, the relationship between the three branches of government. To borrow from Martin Lochlin, at its simplest, Parliament, 
the legislature makes the rules, the courts, the judiciary interpret and vindicate them, and the executive implements them, while also developing the policies that Parliament then considers and may transform into laws. We have an unwritten constitution, which some might think reflects Sam Goldwyn's comments about an oral contract, not worth the paper it's written on. More seriously, the absence of a formal constitution means that Parliament really is supreme, save perhaps in some extreme circumstances which have been touched on by one or two judges, which are most unlikely to occur. The judiciary comes second because it holds the executive to account by ensuring that it acts within the law, and the executive comes third. But that's the position in principle. In practice, of course, the executive is by far and away a long way from being the weakest branch of the state. A thousand times the number of people work for the executive as are in the legislature and the judiciary combined. The executive has day-to-day -day control of government expenditure, now over 40% of GDP. Through prime ministerial patronage and party whips, it has a substantial role in Parliament, where it substantially controls much of the legislation, particularly at times where a single party has an overall majority. The weakest branch of the government is the judiciary, and as Alexander Hamilton famously remarked in the Federalist Papers, the judiciary has no influence over sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or the wealth of the society, and it can take no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. So the judiciary needs a degree of protection, as he pointed out, from the executive and from the legislature. There are periodic tensions between the three branches of government, but that's as it should be. A country where they never, never disagree is unlikely to be one uh, that any, were, any one of us would want to live in, as Lord Bingham rightly remarked. But tension between the three branches should not be equated with suspicion, let alone with public enmity or personal criticism. After all, despite their different constitutional roles, uh, the three branches of government have the common aim of ensuring that our country remains a healthy, just, prosperous democracy committed to the rule of law. It does society no good, uh, whatever, if the different branches start to criticise each other personally. Uh, mutual respect must be the order of the day, even if we sometimes inevitably disagree or have different perspectives. That's the nature of the beast. Mutual respect also requires that the three branches of government should not intrude onto one another's patch. But that doesn't mean the judiciary should have no policy role. Separation of powers does not prevent both Parliament and the executive uh, exercising policy-making roles, and history does not support the notion uh, that the courts should be a policy-free zone. The common law is a continuous product of judicial policy-making through decided cases since 1066, but it's policy-making subject to the legislature. If Parliament does not like what the judiciary decides, Parliament can change the law through statute. But on the other hand, the judiciary has a limited right, indeed on occasions an obligation, to speak out on matters which are properly within its domain, which one could summarise in the concept of the rule of law. <coughs> now, turning to the Human Rights Act, European Union and Judicial Review, they are three issues which are sometimes suggested show that the judiciary has in fact arrogated to itself a much greater policy role. The growth of judicial review, that is citizens coming to court uh, to uh, challenge decisions of the executive uh, as being contrary to law either in the processes or in the outcomes, has grown enormously since the 1960s. That growth does reflect in part or to a great extent, the significant expansion of power on the part of the executive uh, since the 1960s. But it's fair to say that I suspect that it's also attributable to judges who grew up in the questioning 60s and 70s, replacing those who came of age in the more conventional and respectful 40s and 50s. But whether that's right or not, we must always bear in mind that the ability to hold the executive to account – 
is essential to the rule of law. It protects citizens from administrative excess and it ensures that the executive adheres to the law. And I'm sure, provided it's kept within bounds, a judicial review would be seen by sensible members of the executive as being a useful check on their own exercise of their own <coughs> powers. But it's also essential for the maintenance of parliamentary sovereignty. We should take great care in any approach to reduce access to judicial review. It's a small price to pay for a democratic and just society. Turning now to the incorporation of the European Convention uh, into, in, into UK law and our membership of the European Union, it's true that both have given judges significantly greater power over policy questions. But it's very important to emphasize that they do not arise from the judge, uh, grab for power by the judges. Human rights being part of English law and membership of the European Union, each result entirely from the legislature's decisions, from Parliament's decisions, expressed through statute, the European Communities Act in 1972, under which we joined the EU, and the Human Rights Act 1998, the HRA, which incorporated the European Convention into English law. They are two statutes which, like any other statute, judges have a positive duty to follow and apply. And, of course, what Parliament gives, Parliament can take away or cut down. There's a good degree of disquiet about the, the effect that the HRA and the membership of the EU have had on the development of our law and on the relationship between the judiciary, Parliament and the executive. The disquiet is a political matter for democratic debate for those who make the policy uh, in, and the, in the executive, ultimately it is, of course, a, a question for those who make law in Parliament. The judge's role is to apply the law as provided by Parliament, and as I've said, in relation to human rights and in relation to uh, the European Communities Act, if we uphold the law in a way that Parliament doesn't like, Parliament can enact further legislation. But it's fair to say that all too often the consequences of the UK's membership of the EU and the consequences of the adoption of the European Convention on Human Rights are discussed in an absurdly one-sided way, invoking caricature and misrepresentation. Human rights exist to protect the individual from excessive and arbitrary actions of the state, and the international pan-European dimension of the Convention carries significant advantages as well as disadvantages and membership of the EU is also self-evidently a trade-off. But as I say, ultimately the issue of staying in the EU or with the Convention is for Parliament. Judges are not democratically elected or democratically accountable. This ensures that we maintain our independence and impartiality, and it also ensures that we cannot enter into competition with the legislature. However, because they are not elected, Judges do not have to worry about short-term popularity, which means that sometimes they are better placed to take decisions which are unpopular but right, decisions which would sometimes be very difficult or even impossible for MPs who have to perfectly properly have to look uh, to their re-election prospects. One big change to the function of the judges, which was internal in nature, not European, was the Constitutional Reform Act 2005. There are two substantial uh, changes which are worth discussing in relation uh, to that Act. The first was the fact that the 2005 Act changed the whole structure at the top of the judiciary. Gone is the Lord Chancellor in his old style, that anomalous character who was the country's top judge, the judiciary's representative in the Cabinet, and the Speaker of the House of Lords a member of the judiciary, the executive and the legislature, a sort of grand panjandrum or Lord High everything else. The Lord Chief Justice, the LCJ, is now the head of the English and Welsh judiciary, with many of the Lord Chancellor's former administrative, regulatory, educational, communication and disciplinary functions vested in him. He now has a very large, by judicial standards, uh, group of effectively civil servants working uh, to him. The tribunal members, members of all sorts of tribunals, employment tribunals, lands tribunals, 
uh, and so on, have now become judges, more than doubling the size of the judiciary. There's a fairly complex judicial hierarchy, including the Lord Chief Justice's cabinet, consisting of eight or so of the most senior judges, a judicial parliament, more formal regulatory, disciplinary, and educational bodies and rules. Given the importance of the Lord Chief Justice sitting on leading cases, his role has become very burdensome indeed and very important. Judicial appointments, which were once those of the Lord Chancellor entirely, although he consulted and had to make recommendations formally uh, to the Prime Minister and to Her Majesty, but nonetheless he held the key to judicial office and judicial promotion, that has now passed largely to the Judicial Appointments Commission, an organisation consisting of lawyers, judges, but with a majority of lay people. The benefits of the modern appointment system, as I see it so far, are increased transparency, acceptability, professionalism and quality lay involvement. But it comes at a price. As I see it, it consists, that price consists of an increase in cost, delay, loss of judges' time because they spend so much time on appointments, concentration on process perhaps more than outcome at times, and unhappiness for the unsuccessful uh, who doesn't get appointed. In the old days, you got tapped on the shoulder by the Lord Chancellor, so if your friend got tapped and you didn't, you could pretend you never wanted the job. <coughs> Under the present system, you have to apply, everybody knows you've applied, and you get feelings of rejection. Within a small group of proud people, it takes some adjusting. The Lord Chancellor remains the minister responsible for representing the judiciary and cabinet, but despite the fact of his relatively reduced role, he also retains much control over the English and Welsh courts and the judges. He still controls the money, ultimately. He has a degree of responsibility uh, for senior judicial appointments and for ultimate policy. But he paints on a much broader canvas because he is also the minister for the prisons. So under the new system, in a nutshell, the judiciary has the advantages of greater institutional independence and the backing of a stronger and more influential minister and department. But the disadvantage of a minister who is less familiar with the workings of the law and the concerns of the judiciary, and with a budget which extends to a competing, very politically sensitive area, prisons. The other effect of the 2005 Act was the creation of the Supreme Court. The mysterious law lords embodying the most senior UK court were seen to be a constitutional solecism, judiciary muddled in with the legislature. Propriety and visibility were achieved when they emerged after 133 years from a chrysalis locked away in the House of Lords into the sunlight of their own building on the other side of Parliament Square. The Supreme Court justices uh, ha have the same power as the law lords, but we exercise it under much great, greater public awareness. We have our own building, our name says what we are, we have many more visitors, we broadcast our hearings and all our judgments, we have our own websites, even, Peter, our own tweets, not individual justices, I hasten to add, or at least not yet, uh, and our own communication staff. We're entirely separate, not merely from the Ministry of Justice, but also from the other court services in the UK. This openness and transparency is not for reasons of self-importance or self-conscious modernity. It's a fundamental aspect of the administration of justice that it's carried out in public, so citizens know how justice is being done and judges can be held to account. And that's at least as true of the UK's top court as it is of any other court. In the Supreme Court, we have no witnesses and no juries, so broadcasting is no problem. So it's quite right that it's being done. The Supreme Court is not merely the top UK court. It's virtually the only UK court. As Scotland and Northern Ireland each have their entirely separate court systems, judicial systems uh, and legal systems from England and Wales. So of, our, of the 12 justices of the Supreme Court, at least one is Scottish and at least one is Northern Irish. Apart from deciding appeals in important public law and private law disputes, the Supreme Court has also been assigned an important role by Parliament. It now decides devolution issues in relation to Scotland, in relation to Wales and in relation to Northern Ireland. 
and this suggests to some commentators a small move towards the Supreme Court becoming a constitutional court. Without a written constitution, and there's no immediate sign of one, I do not see much further progress uh, towards the possibility of that happening. Of course, next, year, next year's Scottish independence referendum may put an, uh, an end to our jurisdiction north of Hadrian's Wall, but we'll have to wait and see whether there's a yes vote, and if there is, what its consequences are. If there's a no vote, as m many people predict, that there will still be increased powers for Edinburgh, which may well mean more quasi-constitutional devolutionary responsibility for the Supreme Court. The referendum is therefore an important constitutional event which is likely to have a significant effect on the judiciary. But devolution and independence are just the sort of issues into which judges should have no public input. The Welsh position is a little different. At the moment, at any rate, there is no imminent move for Welsh independence. But devolution to Cardiff is being stepped up. Unsurprisingly, the Welsh ministers would like to see a seat on the court reserved for a Welsh justice. At the moment, at any rate, there is, in my view, an insufficient body of Welsh law to justify this, but it's right to acknowledge that things may well change in the future. But as the, Felf, as the Welsh First Minister has fairly said, judicial decisions, and above all those of the Supreme Court, have to command public respect and confidence. Accordingly, the right course I propose to take, which I formally announce this evening, is that on any appeal involving Welsh devolution issues, the Supreme Court panel will, if possible, include a judge who has specifically Welsh experience and Welsh knowledge. So long as there is no such full-time member of the Supreme Court, we will have to look to the Court of Appeal of England and Wales, and I've initiated discussions with the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls in that connection. While judges should keep out of Scottish independence, the most obvious topic on which the judiciary can contribute properly and sometimes have a duty to contribute, is the rule of law. It's therefore entirely proper for the judiciary to stress to the executive and to parliament that it's fundamental to the rule of law that every citizen, perhaps above all the poor, the vulnerable, the disadvantaged, should be able to go to court to vindicate their rights or to defend themselves, whether to challenge excess of executive power, to protect private rights, to be compensated for wrongs, to secure family rights, or to defend themselves if prosecuted. But let me stress a point which I've made before and I make no apology for making again. The historic justification and primary duty of any civilized government is to ensure the defense of the realm from foreign threats and to ensure the rule of law at home, i.e. to ensure its citizens are free, are free from both foreign and domestic threats. If the government cannot provide those timeless and fundamental features, it is not worthy of the name, and all its other services, which have, are of far more recent origin, such as education, health, and welfare, become valueless. Securing the rule of law at home requires, among other things, a high-quality, respected, and independent judiciary, an accessible and effective court system, and an accessible, high-quality, independent legal profession. At the moment, sadly, legal advice and legal proceedings are beyond the means of most people. There are, I think, three principal problems. Legal services are expensive, court procedures are not always proportionate, and money for legal aid is scarce. The legal aid bill increased very substantially in real terms between around 1965 and around 2000, year on year. But since then, it has been cut somewhat and the Ministry of Justice is now regrettably, if unsurprisingly, proposing a significant further reduction. Lawyers and judges have a duty to help make the system work, as well as warning of the risk of cuts. The government, the legal profession and the judiciary each owe it to the public to work constructively to ensure access to justice in the face of the harsh realities of government finances. We judges have to look to our procedures and to make them more efficient and proportionate in all fields, civil, criminal, and family. I think this includes more judicial control before enduring hearings. In civil and family justice, reforms such as the recent Jackson reforms in civil and the recent Norgrove reforms uh, in family are both aimed at 
cutting cost and cutting delay, and hopefully this will improve things. But more radical solutions may be required, such as dispensing with the disclosure of documents and with cross-examination, perhaps even with an oral hearing in smaller cases. Better to have a judge's summary decision quickly at proportionate cost than a disproportionately delayed decision at exorbitant cost, or simply no decision because it's too expensive to go to court. We may well have something to learn from online dispute resolutions, which I think are conducted on eBay and other places. And lawyers, and not merely judges, have their part to pay too. On legal aid, I would like to give two more specific warnings to the government about cuts based on past experience. The first concerns the structuring of any cuts. It's a mistake to have a new legal aid system or new legal aid regime with a cost structure which will drive out the best lawyers. Good lawyers tend to cost more than bad lawyers, but as so often is the case, uh, good lawyers who cost more actually save money in the long run. They save money because they are less likely to waste time in and out of court, they are less likely to be responsible for miscarriages of justice, and they are less likely to engender the need for appeals and retrials. It's also a mistake to structure legal aid costs so as to reward lawyers uh, for doing long trials as opposed to short trials. If you pay more for long trials per day, it inevitably meal means that trials last longer. Lawyers should be rewarded for saving time, not for spending more time. The second point I'd make is that the money problems faced by legal aid are also, of course, faced by the court system. It's vital for the Ministry to appreciate that any changes which are made to reduce legal aid and cut the cost of litigation are likely to have a knock-on effect on the cost of the courts. Less legal aid means more unrepresented litigants and the risk of worse lawyers. That will lead to longer hearings and more judge time. And if we cut down the length and cost of hearings as we should by more judicial control of cases, that will mean more judge time out of court so that the judge can master the details of the case in advance, otherwise he or she will not manage to control the case. Without a strong, uh, independent, respected and responsible judiciary, the rule of law is a dead letter. I believe that at the moment, I hope I don't deceive myself, that we have a very strong and respected judiciary. But there are areas of concern, as the gap between the earnings of successful lawyers, not the legal aid lawyers, and judicial pay increases, maintaining high standards may prove hard. There is also a diversity shortfall, especially at the top. Diversity is important for two reasons. It's simply unjust if people have fewer opportunities in life because of, for instance, their gender, sexuality, ethnicity, socio-economic background or disability. This is all the more so in a profession, the legal profession and the judiciary, dedicated to justice. Secondly, if judicial positions are only open to a small proportion of the population, it's statistically inevitable that we are not appointing the best and the brightest, and that's against the national interest. On diversity, we've made some progress. Gender diversity is increasing. The Court of Appeal is now about to have seven lady justices, and up till now there have never been more than four. Recent appointments to the High Court show an appointment rate of about 30% for women and things are better lower down. A lot more work, however, needs to be done in other respects. The ethnic minority representation among the senior judiciary is very low, and the socio-economic background of the senior judiciary is almost monolithic. These figures reflect the makeup of the legal profession, where, for instance, 11 or 12% of the top QCs and partners in the top firms are women. Given that judiciary is drawn from the profession of lawyers, uh, this poses significant problems in increasing diversity. But the duty on the judiciary to improve diversity also applies to the legal profession. Lawyers occupy a special place in society. You have a right to a lawyer. You don't have a right to an accountant or even a doctor, but a right to a lawyer is fundamental. But that carries with it responsibilities as well as rights for the lawyers. The legal profession must do more to improve diversity. More broadly, if we really want to increase diversity as a society, the problem has to be tackled throughout, in our universities, in our schools and at home. 
Finally, on the legal profession, while it's a bit of a, an oversimplification, there are currently two legal professions, and I'm not referring to barristers and solicitors, but to lawyers who serve rich individuals and companies, and lawyers who serve ordinary citizens. Both are vital to this country, but in very different ways. In a capitalist world, a country needs first-class lawyers to advise and act for businesses. Our commercial lawyers don't merely do that, they do much more. They've made London probably the commercial, legal and dispute resolution centre of the world, greatly supporting the UK economy. The other lawyers, those who serve ordinary citizens, are vital to the rule of law. Without competent legal advice represent and representation, as I've said, legal rights would be worthless. The former group of lawyers, those advising rich individuals and companies, are doing fine. The latter are under intense pressure from legal aid, aid cuts, and it's fair to say, in some areas at any rate, from an overmanned profession. Now, I've covered quite a lot of ground, so inevitably I've rather skated over quite a few issues. That was intentional. I wanted to stimulate you to ask questions. I'm about to discover whether that's successful. But please feel free, as Peter said, to raise any points uh, once he's um, had his wicked way with me, uh, whether or not uh, those points have been touched on in this brief talk. I cannot promise to answer them all satisfactorily, but I'll do my best. Thank you very much. David, thank you very much indeed for that um, a formidable covering of so many issues, and I'm, I'm sure others will come out. Could I d just begin, I mean, something you've touched on a number of times, particularly going back to the 2005 Act, your ability and the ability of you know, Lord Chief Justice um, um, in his, his administrative role as much as anything else, but in your role at the President of the Supreme Court, to raise issues of concern pre-05, um, you would have been a member of the House of Lords, able to speak and occasionally vote, something your predecessors did on issues. I mean, the famous case of um, um, in the morning, um, the um, law lords, as they then were, fighting against the Home Secretary, and two or three of them voting against a, a measure proposed by that same Home Secretary in the House of Lords in the afternoon, which brought it out. But even without that kind of extreme case, do you feel that you have the opportunities to raise issues of concern? You know, you made the point of, of, of um, legal aid, but there are also access to judicial review in view of some of the points being raised on the change of that sufficiently now, and do your colleagues do? I think that the advantage that we had when we were in the House of Lords was that we could indeed raise points mm. in, in, on the floor of the House as members of the legislature. Um, the view was taken, I wasn't sure if I agreed with it at the time, like most lawyers I'm probably inherently slightly conservative, but I think it was right in retrospect, that in, in the modern world you just couldn't have people who were, as you've described, uh, judges in the morning and politicians, mm -hmm. even if they were restrained politicians, mm -hmm. in the afternoon. And um, I, I, there, there are various ways we can express views. We express them in judgments, but of course they, that, that can only be when the particular issue comes to us and the comment we make is relevant, so that's quite constrained mm -hmm. and to some extent governed by happenstance. Uh, we can express our views uh, to some extent um, to, the, um, to the minister, to the Lord Chancellor, um, but sometimes, uh, and that is certainly done principally between the Lord Chief Justice mm -hmm. and, and the um, uh, 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 and the Lord Chancellor, because the Lord Chief Justice has now probably about 4,000 judges, although in a sense the President, well, the, the President of the Supreme Court is the senior judge in the UK, but as the Chair of the Judicial Appointments Commission put to me, I have a cricket team, he has an army, <laughs> but uh, he, he has 4,000 judges, and so the concern of the judiciary is largely expressed to, by the mm. Lord Chief Justice to the Lord Chancellor. On other issues, we can speak out in, in the way that I've done today, but one mm. has to be careful not to go outside the bounds. There's also the power that the Lord Chief Justice has, which I've recently got to, which is to be able to go to Parliament mm. uh, if something gets too serious and uh, a greater problem. It's what I would call a nuclear option, mm. but we can ask to go to Parliament to express concerns. Um, uh, it hasn't yet happened. Um, uh, the other thing is that there has developed 
um, I think it's now in practice, an, inevitable, uh, an invariable practice, that at least once a year uh, we give evidence to the Constitutional mm -hmm. Committee of the House of Lords, and they raise questions of concern with us and invite us to raise questions that, mm -hmm. that or concerns that we have. I mean, exactly. I mean, on, on, on that, I mean, the, the accountability, I mean, to take a, a, an interesting parallel example, we had here um, three weeks ago Paul Tucker, the, the about to depart Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. Well, he and Mervyn King um, are again about to step down as governor, constantly appearing in front of parliamentary committees um, to, to appear. Would you welcome more appearances, either in front of um, Alan Beast Justice Committee or as you say, the, the Constitutional Committee of the Lords to explain some of your concerns, obviously not going into cases or anything like that. I think because of the importance of the separation of mm. powers, it's, it's important that we aren't, in, that judges aren't in and out of the House of Commons mm. and House of Lords too often. I think it's important that we have a channel of communication and I think it should be disciplined. I think in an ideal world, it would be through either the Justice Committee or the clerk of the mm -hmm. house, mm -hmm. in the case of the House of Commons, and through, I would have thought, the Lord Chief Justice's office, mm -hmm. um, and through my office if it's the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. I think that there, it, to some, that there has been quite a spate of judges giving mm -hmm. evidence, but that's because there haven't have been a number of bills where mm -hmm. judicial input was quite valuable. But you, you'll see judges being quite careful when they're asked questions thinking to themselves, is this a policy question that I shouldn't answer? Mm -hmm. Or is it a question of how, what effect it will have on the way the courts work or on the way cases might develop? Will it lead to a rash of cases or something like that? Yeah. Um, I think we're all a bit more relaxed than we were. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good thing. But a as with everything, one has to be a bit on one's guard to make sure one's not too comfortable, probably. Now, one sentence I was very struck by, um, when you were talking, ultimately, the, the big issues on the EU or the um, ECHR for Parliament, but then you contrasted the position of the judiciary and MPs. However, because they're not elected, judges do not have to worry about short-term popularity, which means they can take decisions which are unpopular but right, which would be more difficult or even impossible for MPs, and you said because of their need to find re-election. What did you quite mean by that? Well, there's an ob obvious area. Parliament, uh, Parliament uh, no, another view of it, which is, is, is by way of example and highlighting it, Parliament will decide on policy issues. The courts apply them in individual mm. cases. There will be cases where you have to balance the right of individuals' privacy mm. against the public's right to know. Uh, you have to balance um, somebody's uh, legal or the, the state's legal right to remove somebody mm. against the fact they are human rights not to be uh, attacked or tortured or executed when they go back to the country they should be sent back to where the Human Rights Convention would say they can't go. I think it's easier for judges to say that somebody who seems extremely undesirable, unattractive, who's possibly making a, getting a lot of money out of the state for his or her home or family or whatever mm. can stay here under the Human Rights mm. Act and for, par for, for the Home Secretary to decide it would be more difficult, not for any reason to do with who she is or he would be if it was a male Home Secretary, but simply because it would be a very unpopular decision. But I think people will take it more from judges. But there's one corollary of that is that, um, and that's been true really, I mean it's linked with I suppose the growth of judicial review and particularly since the Human Rights Act, is you, you come and sustained attack in uh, the mail, the sun, mm. etc. Um, these unelected people telling us what to do. Now, mm. being elected, of course, um, 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 fundamentally misunderstands the position. But it does put you in a more exposed position. Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the effect of the European Union law and human rights law is that the judges have had more of a policy responsibility mm. in practice. And um, that means that our decisions are of greater interest to the press more mm. often. And if the press doesn't like our decisions, they are rude about us sometimes. Mm. Um, I had one particular experience of that, uh, where one newspaper was very nice about me and the, another one wasn't. So my wife changed the newspaper she read. Well, <laughs> 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 but I, I, think, I think on the whole, I mean, it sounds a bit patronizing. I don't mean it to be that. But you, you do feel sometimes, well, I, I'm being attacked in the newspaper for this. 
Sometimes you feel actually they've got a point. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you think maybe I wasn't right. Sometimes you think, well, that's the law and I was doing my duty. Sometimes you get a bit cross. Mm -hmm. But the caravan tends to move on. One, one thing I have developed is great sympathy for politicians mm -hmm. because they're under the press scrutiny the whole time, whereas uh, we're occasionally <coughs> under it and then the caravan moves on. And not always, I imagine, on totally predictable cases. No, so you're absolutely right. Uh, it's always the ones you don't expect. Right. Yes, that's quite true. Well, the other, before I, just one other point that I was very struck by was your reluctance to um, become a, a constitutional court in the Supreme Court. That you know you do have responsibilities on the devolution settlement. Um, of course, you could argue that many of your judgments are are, are, are considerable constitutional importance. I mean, some of the ones um, when you went on the Supreme Court or when it was still pre pre O five. Um, uh, 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 some of the challenges brought there, and then in the early years of the Supreme Court under the hunting challenge and all that, which had very big constitutional consequences. Isn't it bound to develop more? Uh, we, may not, we may be a long way away from a, 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 a formally codified constitution in the conventional sense, but the more you have constitutional um, legislation of various kinds, the more it's likely to come and come up to you. Yes, I think, in a sense, when, when, I, when, one, when I talk to French, German, yeah. Italian judges mm. and so on, they are much less interested in Human Rights Convention and Strasbourg Court because they have almost all of it in their own constitution mm -hmm. and they sometimes, having decided the, dis the case on the basis of their constitution, they have a quick look at the Human Rights Convention to make sure it's consistent, their decision is consistent with that. But in to that extent, the Human Rights Convention has become a sort of mini constitution mm -hmm. for us, if you mm -hmm. like. And uh, the devolution issues mm. are quite like constitutional and the European Union enables us on occasions, not enables us, it's our duty sometimes to override national legislation. All that has made us look more like a constitutional court and it may be, at the moment I don't think it is a fig leaf, but uh, it may be that in due course saying, well Parliament has given us all these powers and Parliament could take them away will become something of a fig leaf, but at the moment it shows no sign of that. And if Parliament was decided to pull out the Human Rights Act, uh, pull out the Human Rights Convention and pull out of the European Union, um, we would be left simply with our devolution-type constitutional issues. Well, you'd be left with a lot more cases if, if, it, if that happened. We would be left with quite a lot of tangled issues to determine. You're absolutely right. But you'd have to determine. I mean, the interesting thing, I mean, yes. don't do too hypothetical. If pulled out of the ECHR, it would all, all fall on you, wouldn't it? The interpretation of a lot of issues. Well, I, I think that there'd be two difficult questions. One is that our law has developed quite a lot since 2000 due to the Human Rights Convention, mm. and we'd have to reconsider whether we simply took it from there mm. or un, 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 tangled, disentangled it. And secondly, of course, the big issue would be uh, what the Human Rights Convention would be replaced by. Hmm. And exactly the same point would apply with the EU law, because then you'd be talking about 40 years yes. of the key and so on. That's um, quite right. Um, so you're right, either way, I suppose, uh, work, we're going to be kept busy. <laughs> and ju just pursuing that just briefly, you've got two courts in Europe. Um, how, uh, how can you keep up with what they're doing? when you're doing cases? Because you, know, you have a pretty steady workload. No, not, no, not as much, obviously, as the Court of Appeal, but a pretty steady one of very big cases. I think um, th there are two ways in which you've got to keep up with them. One in terms of their decisions. Mm -hmm. And one of the very good things about being a, a judge in, in the United Kingdom is that we have a very good legal profession. And, of course, um, in the Supreme Court, you tend to get the best barristers, mm -hmm. or a lot of the best barristers. And we rely quite a lot on them to dig out the cases mm. and, and tell us what the law is. Sometimes we will do a bit of research of our own, but uh, UK judges are quite fortunate in not having to ensure they keep up with the law. They rely mm. largely on the uh, barristers and advocates in front of them mm. to do that. The other thing, though, is keeping in touch with the Luxembourg and Strasbourg judges, because I think it's important they understand where we're coming from and we understand where they're coming from. I mean, one thing is that England, in particular England and Wales, have a common law system, which is a slightly different system from the rest of Europe, apart from Malta and Ireland mm -hmm. and Cyprus, I think, which have, all those countries tend to have a code system and judges develop the law less than in this country. And sometimes the Strasbourg Court in particular 
sometimes misunderstands the way we work. And I think it's important that we make ourselves felt there. And I think, you know, we are. They are seeing, benefiting from what we're doing. And I, I think we're learning a bit from them too. Mm. One point you made on, on the legal aid, apart from the, the, the general proposition and, and uh, there's an interesting audience um, here for your, your remarks, but directly to the, um, uh, the, the, the department in that respect for the permanent secretary here. But there's another aspect to it, which is that the UN did this very interesting thing as the two professions. Yes. Um, the, 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 the one which is servicing, it's almost an aspect of London being different from the rest of the country in a way, even though there are a lot of people in, in the second profession in London by definition because of poor and dealing with all new cases. Does that involve a more radical restructure of the legal profession to recognise those two aspects? Because all barristers are treated, as, so, so to speak, equally, but in fact they're doing very, very different things. You're right. I mean, I, I think it, the legal profession, unsurprisingly, I suppose, is something of a microcosm mm. of the country. I mean, there have always been rich and poor, there have always been lawyers who've done commercial cases and made a lot of money, and those who've done children cases and, and mm -hmm. ordinary criminal cases who haven't made a great deal of money. But I, I think that the, the, the gap in society over the past 40 years between the, the more very rich and relatively more poor, mm -hmm. the gap has increased. And I think that that's reflected in the legal profession. I, I'm pretty chary about saying what should be done to the legal profession. I, 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 a, I'm not sure, and B, I, I don't think it's for me to say what I can say about, about the legal profession is what I've said. Namely, mm -hmm. it's important that so far as they're government funded that, that we do ensure that they're, we keep a strong legal profession, but equally there's a duty on the legal profession to, to make things work and to appreciate that the government hasn't got a, a bottomless purse. And indeed, was quite, it was, the legal profession was quite well funded from legal aid over a long period. Right, now I'll, I'll op open it up to um, questions. Um, I, I see the eager hand of uh, Vernon Bogdaner. Well, I, I want to follow up a point you raised about the Human Rights Act, which, which I think is very crucial because it, it seems to me that it draws a wedge between the judiciary and Parliament because it leaves ambiguous as to who's finally responsible for human rights. I mean, you would say that Parliament is sovereign and is responsible, and I'm sure most MPs would agree with that. They'd say, we are accountable to the people, we ought to decide. But some of your colleagues, I mean, Lord Hope, Lady Hale, possibly others, would say, no, uh, we are in theory the final guardian. The rule of law trumps parliamentary sovereignty and if there was a clash between them, for instance, if people were denied access to the courts, then we would um, possibly supply a statute or part of a statute as we did in relationship to the European Union. So it seems to me the chance of a conflict between the judges and the politicians are much greater, perhaps than you suggest, because the judges are dealing with very small, unpopular, vulnerable minorities I mean, suspected terrorists, prisoners, asylum seekers, who uh, don't have much popular support. And it seems possible that sometime in the future a case will arise with a real difference. And there's a difference in, as it were, the rule of recognition as to what the Constitution actually is. They're two views. I once asked a predecessor of yours, what would happen if the sovereignty of Parliament conflicted with the rule of law? And he smiled at me and said, that's a question that shouldn't be asked. Now, it may be we can muddle through in a good old British way, but it may be that we can't, and that we're increasingly seeing these conflicts between two different views of what the Constitution actually says. I, I think in the leaving issues at the margin out, and I'll come back to them, because I think that's what your question relates to ultimately. I think that, that undoubtedly Parliament gives guidance as to how to take the most obvious and popular example, how the balance between privacy and freedom of the press, if you like, to broadcast things about your private life and your right to say, no, you can't, gives guidance as to how the balance is to be achieved. Parliament gets, can't decide individual cases. It lays down the principles. The court then applies and inevitably develops and makes up some rules as it goes along. If that's going too far in favour of the press or too far in favour of uh, privacy, then Parliament intervenes and, in general terms, tries to redress the balance. So I think that's where the balance lies. You're absolutely right that there is a debate, which I regard as somewhat um, hypothetical, but I may turn out to be right, about what would happen to take an extreme case if Parliament decided one day that it was simply not open to the citizen to challenge a decision of the executive and simply said judicial review is over, the executive is free to do what it's like, it likes. Now, if we got to that point, you would have the conflict between parliamentary sovereignty and the court's duty to enforce the rule of law. 
I slightly feel that this is a, an interesting argument, which, uh, if it happens, we're all so far up the spout that really it's an interesting academic argument. But you know, you're getting to the position if the courts were to say, no, you can't do that. We would have the sort of parliament that says you can't go to court, which would send in troops to remove the judges. We'd be into that world. And, and you can argue about it as a nice constitutional issue, but I think it's unlikely to arise. My other answer is, um, if we did have a serious argument about that, and you're right, Lord Hope and Lord Lady Hale, and possibly one other, I touched on it in the hunting case. If it did come to that, I think in the best British traditions, I would say, and this is how the common law works, it's all very interesting to talk about in theory, when the case comes, we'll decide it, and sufficient unto the day. But I think that if you got to a point where the courts did, as it were, declare war on Parliament because Parliament had declared war on the courts, we would be in a situation where uh, we just wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to go and we would not be in a world where one could, which would be familiar to us. And I, I think it'd be very difficult to predict what would happen. If it happens, uh, it will be the judge's duty to deal with it as best they can. Right, gentlemen there. And we'll, we'll take uh, two or three together. And could you say who you are as well, please? Hello, I'm Matt Williams. I'm a lecturer at Oxford in politics. I was wondering if you're, the task of the courts in enforcing the rule of law is made more difficult because Parliament is creating so much law, a lot of it rather ambiguous in language in order to maximise the discretion of the executive, but then inevitably having, uh, involving the judges and making more policy decisions. I can answer that one very easily. The answer is yes. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that let, me, let me say something in defence of the, drafts, the drafters of legislation. I think they have a very difficult task. But I think there has been uh, what one former law lord, and that, to be fair, this was a bit of time ago, referred to as an orgy of legislation. And when you have acts of parliament that holds wedges of which never get brought into effect and are repealed before they can be brought into effect, something's gone badly wrong. I, 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 I can see that the pressure, it's easy for judges to say this shouldn't be happening. The political pressures are something which is sometimes difficult to resist. But I think we could do with fewer, more carefully drafted laws. And could I say the Institute for Government is playing an active role in this itself. We, uh, in this very room, uh, Richard Heaton, who's the uh, Parliamentary Council, launched his campaign um, to clarify and make the law in its drafting uh, more accessible. Uh, also something linked, it, linked to the National Archive. And um, Richard Heaton's taking an active role, and we're going to follow that up ourselves here on that point. That doesn't for involve the quality, but I hope the quality. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, sorry, gentleman there. Alan Patterson, Professor. Um, uh, Lord Jumuga, can I take you back to prof uh, Professor Bogdano's uh, point? Um, it, there was a, uh, one of the home sectors of the past, uh, Clark, uh, as famously uh, is known, wrote to your predecessor, Lord Bingham, and said, you keep knocking me back in these control order cases or the, the you know, Belmarsh and so on. Uh, wouldn't it help if we had a bit of joined up government and the two branches of government talk to each other? And you can see how they could construct a, 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 a case where you know, members of the public will be told, well, you know, two branches of government won't talk to each other. Um, and you said you want to be very careful about the lines of communication, but if we ever got near to the territory of the two branches declaring war on each other, would there not be an argument for lines of communication? Uh, why, why do you feel this is so dangerous? I think it, the Charles Clark example is a very good one. If Charles Clark, the Home Secretary, and a few people from the Home Department had got together with a few law lords, as they then were, or Supreme Court justices, as they would now be, and the Supreme Court justices had said, well, Home Secretary, we think if you uh, impose a home curfew on people for 14 hours, that would be too long, but 13 hours would just about be all right. And he then went away and drafted legislation. And then somebody was locked up for 13 hours at home and brought proceedings. They would be shut out of coming to court, or else the judges would look idiots, because uh, we would have said 13 hours was OK. We then listened to the argument and think, actually, having heard the arguments put forward on behalf of this character, um, we think maybe 13 hours is too long. 
Uh, and I, 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 we, we effectively deprived people of the opportunity of going to court because we would have decided the issue in advance. Or we would look idiots because we'd be going back on our advice to the Home Secretary. Having said that, I entirely agree with you that if we, get the so if we got the sort of serious breakdown of the sort that, that Professor Bogdanov has raised as a, as a possibility, desperate situations require desperate remedies. And it might be that, that something which would normally be unacceptable and wrong uh, would be appropriate because it would be better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. And in the end, as a judge brought up on the common law, uh, in the end, uh, the lifeblood of the common law is not logic. It's experience and good sense. And I think you're right, in an extreme circumstance, something which would normally be wrong uh, would be a l the least bad option. Well, yes. no, no, so It's a fair point, but, it, but the other thing Charles Clark could have done would have been to consult some retired, recently retired judges, because they're, they are not judges anymore, they have the experience, and they don't have the embarrassment of deciding the case or being members of the court that decides the case, having given advice on the very point. Right, Sadiq Khan, we just, the Shadow Justice Secretary. Can I begin by commending you on your fantastic uh, speech? I'm pleased the Permanent Secretary is here because uh, she will give a copy to the current Justice Secretary as a tutorial <laughs> on, uh, on the way the law should work. Look, uh, uh, first, can I suggest that Charles Clark is a good friend. Uh, your colleagues were right to say no to him. I've just returned recently from Pakistan as ele an election observer, uh, and they had their first ever uh, full parliamentary five-year term for the reasons that the judges were in cahoots with the executive, uh, and long may that continue. My question is linked with that, actually, which is one of the reasons that uh, the military didn't step in in Pakistan was because there is now a healthy tension between the separation of powers. And my question to you is this. Bear in mind you mentioned the extreme advantage the executive and legislature have over the judiciary with resources. Do you think it's time you and other colleagues, junior colleagues as well, thought about how you manage getting across judgments better than you currently do. I mean, Peter referred to the Mail and the Express, but if somebody explained some of your judgments rather than simply releasing the judgment um, to explain the consequences, why you'd reached the decision you had, wouldn't that mean the public would better understand why you've decided what you've decided to do, but also it would mean you'd be more uh, present to the public? And the and final point linked to that is, so for example, it, in the future we could see a question time with members of the executive, uh, legislature and judiciary present answering questions from David Dimbleby and the audience. I think, I think in, in answer to your question about making judgments uh, uh, available and clearer, the Supreme, one of the good things about the Supreme Court, and I can't take credit for it, it was done right from the start um, by my predecessor Nicholas Phillips with Jenny Rowe, the chief executive who's here this evening, is to um, have not merely the judgment, but also um, a press handout, which summarizes the effect of the judgment on two or three pages. And uh, it's happening tomorrow, actually. Uh, on Wednesdays, we will read out an even more short version, an even shorter version, of the uh, summarizing what we've decided. Now, it may be a, that this should be done in the Court of Appeal and High Court more often than it is. And um, B, it may be that copies of these summaries aren't getting where they should. I don't know, did, uh, I, will, I will make inquiries, but certainly they ought to be publicly available because some of our judgments run to 100 paragraphs, 200 paragraphs, and you're absolutely right. It's nothing short of ridiculous to expect even lawyers who are interested but not concerned with the precise case to understand what we've decided and to expect journalists or politicians or any non-lawyers who have very lots of things to do to understand our decisions if we just hand them out 100 paragraphs, 200 paragraphs is, is quite wrong and we've tried to deal with that. 
and it may be we should try and push it more than we have. So far as judges go on question time is concerned, I think it's been tried once or twice by a Lord Chief Justice. I think the trouble is that on an occasion like this, you have people who know what sort of questions I'm able to answer in question time. The whole point is to ask a wide range of questions. And um, I think judges are not very keen on, and, and for reasons I've given really, should not speak out about publicly about things other than they're competent professionally to speak out about. The danger is we might look not merely ignorant, or, but we might overstep the mark. It's quite an attractive idea. Um, I can think of some of my colleagues who do it better than others, but I think on the whole... <laughs> <laughs> but on the whole, I think it would be better avoided, I'm afraid. Yes, I, I think the number of times you'd have to say no comment. I, I think the subject of marital tiffs might come up this week, which is, I don't think one you'd wish to comment on. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Amy Williams, London School of Economics. Um, you've spoken about the Human Rights Act as the European Convention incorporated. Um, and in light of the recommendation of the Commission on a Bill of Rights, the majority recommendations that, in light of a lack of ownership of the Human Rights Act as a European import, we need a UK Bill of Rights. Could you speak to the contention that the Human Rights Act is in fact a UK Bill of Rights rather than simply the European Convention incorporated into our law, given the Section 3 and 4 mechanism, the missing various other arguments for, for that contention? Well, I mean, put simply, you're absolutely right. It is a UK Bill of Rights, because while I've talked about the Convention being part of our law, in fact, you're absolutely right. Technically, it's more complicated. The Act is our law, and that's what we apply. And the Act has sections that tells us what to do, and that is a British UK Act. And if you want to dig a bit more into the history, you can say that the uh, con European Convention was largely drafted by, I was going to say English lawyers, but with Alan Patterson here, I better accept it's mostly Scottish lawyers. But, but more importantly, you're right, um, it, it, is a, it is British. But having said that, the principal concern, I think, of people who are not happy about it being a European Convention is that the Strasbourg Court ultimately, again, save in exceptional circumstances, will have the last word. So on certain contentious issues like prisoners' voting rights, there's a feeling, and whether it's right or wrong, I, I, can't, I, I fully understand it, that we should not be told by um, a foreign court, as it were, even if there's a UK representative, whether or not we should decide through our democratically elected members whether prisoners should have the vote or not. And I think that is, that is the difficulty. And that I very briefly described as a trade-off um, in relation to the EU, and it's equally a trade-off here. We, we, we benefit um, by having uh, human rights across Europe. Um, the Strasbourg Court has to apply the law on the whole, bearing in mind that what it says applies to uh, a relatively developed, mature, um, just and, and democratic country like this, where you might say they should just let us get on with it and they shouldn't be niggling about little concerns. But they have to bear in mind the effect on other countries tending to be in the east of Europe where uh, human rights are not so respected. Um, I also think that we, you know, our law has, it isn't meant to be a sort of political point, but we benefited from Strasbourg in the sense that they've made us think a bit outside the box. And I think it's been a two-way process. I think one, the strength, one of the strengths of our systems is relative certainty in that when judges decide things, uh, that, that sets a principle that courts then follow, particularly if it's the Supreme Court. The European tendency, particularly France and Italy, has been the senior court decides something, the top court, junior courts don't necessarily follow it. And Strasbourg used to be like that. And they're now more disciplined and more consistent. And I think that is our influence. So I think the influence has been two-way. I've got time for two more questions out of many. Um, just in front of you, Kerry, Peter Brook. Oh, no. uh, I had 24 years in the House of Commons, 12 years in the, so far in the House of Lords. Uh, my first four, four years in government were in the Whip's office, and at that, at that, in that period, uh, timetabling required a quite complicated process of 
the matter being debated on the floor of the House before the timetabling was granted. By the time I left the Commons, timetabling was essentially in the hands of the government from, from, from the start. Uh, but uh, unless it's changed, when, when I left the Commons, the, how the time, t the time was used was in the hands of the opposition. So that if the opposition wished not to, to discuss a particular aspect that was controversial in a bill, uh, they could so run the timetable that it, it never got debated in the Commons at all, and indeed a lot of legislation reaches us in the House of Lords without having been scrutinized in any way. Um, uh, particularly when it's de dealing with highly controver controversial matters, which, which have not been uh, debated in the Commons, uh, do you think it's in the interest of lawmaking that the matter is left entirely to the House of Lords, or, or do, you th do you think it would be better if the Commons, in fact, did express an opinion? Uh, could I, let's group those. Um, the gentleman in front there, if you, if you could make it terribly brief, because we're sure. going to uh, Hi, I'm Barba. I work for a, a member of Parliament. Um, do you think that it should be an essential requirement for the office holder of the Secretary of State for Justice to be or have been a lawyer? Right, and there's one here. And I think we'll take four. It's, it's, it's a nice and brief, thanks. This is um, a very different arena, which is about diversity, and you talked about diversity in the paid judiciary. I've been doing some research about diversity in the lay magistracy, and that has not improved in the last 10 years. Is that something you think some action should be taken about? Right, and just one gentleman there, that's, that'll be our final one. Timothy King, retired circuit judge. Um, Lord Newberger, given the expansion um, of uh, judicial review, do you feel that there is a tendency on the part of the executive um, to erode judicial independence? Right, four d diverse and very interesting questions. The more, uh, in answer to um, Lord Brooke, it'd be Peter Brooke's question, um, the more scrutiny there is of legislation, the better. Um, one of the great improvements in the House of Commons, I believe, I think at the time you were there, was the committee system, and which enabled bills to be looked at more carefully. Um, I, I, it's so far away from my duty and knowledge to tell the House of Commons what it should be doing that I'm going to steer right off that. But all I can say is that picking out the point about legislation the more scrutiny there is and the more careful scrutiny there is, the better. Um, but I think that MPs have an awful lot to do and it's a reason for keeping uh, legislation within bounds in terms of quantity so that it can be achieved. Um, Lord Chancellor being a lawyer, I think that for the first time we have a Lord Chancellor who isn't a lawyer. We originally had a Lord Chancellor who was almost always been a barrister uh, who was not really a primarily a politician um, normally uh, and who was brought in for government. Then we had two uh, new style Lord Chancellors, um, Jack Straw and, and Ken Clark, both of whom had been lawyers and who were towards the end of their careers. Now we have um, a Lord Chancellor who's not a lawyer and who's by no means at the end of his career and it was the situation which, to be honest, I think that was feared in some quarters under the new regime. And so far, I have to say, it has worked uh, well and much, much better than those who feared uh, what it would bring uh, f uh, expected. Um, I think we are in a new world uh, w with, with this idea of a Lord Chancellor who's in the House of Commons, who's a career politician and who's not a lawyer. But on the whole, one of the good things about having an unwritten constitution is that we get used to managing and coping and dealing with things as they come along. And with goodwill on all three sides, um, parliamentary, executive, and Lord Chancellor himself and his private secretary and the judiciary, I, I think it can be made to work. And I think interestingly, um, because the Lord Chancellor is uh, not uh, on familiar territory, in a way uh, he can be more aware of the constitutional proprieties and niceties because they are new to him. 
So, and I, I think so far, so good. Um, on the magistracy, I don't know the figures, but if, the div if diversity was not good and has got no better, uh, then that is bad news. Um, I m know relatively little about the magistracy, so I'm afraid all I can say is that diversity on the face of it is a, is a good thing, provided you don't sacrifice quality for diversity. And I would have thought you, you could have improved diversity quite easily with the magistracy without spoiling quality, but I'm not an expert on it. Um, on judicial review and interference with the uh, independence of the judiciary, um, I, I have to say that my, at the moment I have not seen any sign over the past 20 years of any serious interference with judicial independence. The nearest we've got is uh, government ministers from time to time, often home secretaries, particularly early on in, in, in their careers, um, saying things about judges which can be interpreted in a worrying way. But uh, in terms of what they've actually done, I think governments have not interfered with the judiciary. I think with the cuts in, in, in the, the attitude on judicial pay and judicial pensions, uh, some judges are, are upset about that, but I don't regard that as an interference with the independence of the judiciary. Um, and I, I think that if you look at what governments do, um, this country is remarkably fortunate, not only, I hope, in its judges, but also in the way that the judges have been treated in terms of actual actions uh, by, uh, and mostly in, in, in what's been said, by politicians. David, thank you very much indeed, both for your uh, original speech and its breadth and depth, and also for the candour in, in answering a wide variety of questions. I'm glad you confirmed that um, the Supreme Court uh, tweets. We'll have to see uh, what the Twitter traffic has been on, on this evening. I, I was just thinking about um, one of your predecessors when you were Master of the Rolls, one of your predecessors there from Hampshire, how um, Lord Denning's tweets would have been. I'm not sure he'd have fitted in 140 characters somehow. Um, he, that might have tested him, um, and he wouldn't have quite got the right to turn in it. But it, it's, it's um, uh, um, interesting that, as you say, it's a collective tweet, not an individual one. You don't uh, give your judgments on that. But we, um, one thing I'm certain of is, by your contribution, you would have stimulated a wide debate on a number of very key issues. Um, I'm delighted there was such a diverse audience here to, to hear your views and uh, communicate them, no doubt, backward uh, to, the, to, to those, particularly on one or two subjects. So I'm delighted you've come to the Institute for Government. I, I uh, uh, look forward to welcoming you back again uh, in the future, but I hope the audience can join me in thank you very much indeed. Thank you.